Hello there. Today's topic is time management, the new rules of time management, what you need to know and what you need to forget. You know, some people say time management is dead. <laughs> well, I don't know if it's dead, but listen to this. 82% of 500 people surveyed by the Development Academy say they do not have a time management system at all. No time management system. And this was people between the ages of 18 to 65 split evenly. No time management system at all. Well, I don't think time management is dead, like I said, but I do think that we need to hear about some new perspectives and new ideas because things that used to work just don't work. <laughs> One of my favorite things in the world was my day timer system. Did you ever have one of those systems? Like they had a million different parts with them. They were so much fun to play with. But today with digital calendars, the day timer system is obsolete for me. Although there's probably some people out there that still enjoy it. So things are different. Today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to help you with all your time management struggles. <laughs> I have three things in particular that I want to focus on. And then at the end, I'll give you a bonus tip. But the three things that we're going to talk about today is, first of all, how to be proactive. Secondly, how to focus. That's an important ability, the ability to focus. And finally, how to be personally productive. So let's start, as I often like to start, with a definition of time management. A definition. Time management is the ability to plan and control how you spend the hours in your day to effectively accomplish your goals. Okay, that's nice, right? It's the ability to plan and control, if only, right? <laughs> how you spend the hours in your day to effectively accomplish your goals. Well, if you're like me, you've heard a lot of, of things about time management, what people say works and what people say doesn't work, right? I'm wondering what you've heard. I'd love to hear what you've heard about time management and what you're basing your time management system on, unless you're in that 82% that has no system at all. I've heard things like you have to prioritize. Yeah, that makes perfect sense to me. What's hard for me sometimes is figuring out how to do that. How do I figure out which is most important? I, I've heard, you know, you have to have a good calendar, right? And I talked about my daytimer system that I loved. And I remember my, my daughter, just a few years ago, she bought this really elaborate system. I'm not sure what it was called. It cost a fortune. <laughs> she was in college and she was convinced this was going to fix everything, you know? And I think it was more fun than helpful, but it was a nice distraction for a while. And today, calendars, oh my gosh, I get so confused. I have Outlook, I have Google, I have iCal, all these calendars. I can't tell you the number of hours that I've spent trying to figure out how to sync all of those different calendars, right? So a calendar, sure, that's a good idea. Keeping a to-do list. I like to-do lists. I like multiple to-do lists. The thing we have to worry about with to-do lists, and I've heard this, is that some people consider the to-do list to be their only time management system. Now, that's, that's not really a time management system. <laughs> We're going to talk about that a little bit today. Speaking of systems, you know, one thing I've heard is you do need a system. I agree. And, but the thing is, unless I go and buy it off the shelf and have all those little parts and fun, then what is a system? And, and yeah, so that's something we'll talk about, too. So there's some news about time management. These are some things I think you should know that's happening in the world. And, and after the session, I encourage you just to go to Google and, you know, and enter 2021 time management statistics and read about some of this stuff for yourself. Okay, so here, check this one out. In the last 20 years, working time has increased by 15% and leisure time has decreased by 33%. Yikes, right? Now, confession, that statistic was recorded before COVID. I would love to know how COVID's impacted this. Um, I want to hope that leisure time has increased, but I don't know if forced leisure time is less 
or more stressful. <laughs> anyway, we can learn from this number. I mean, leisure time has decreased by 33%. I mean, that makes sense. You know, back in the day, there was a little availability after hours. It was hard to reach people, you know. Um, Today, we carry work with us in our back pocket everywhere we go, I'm afraid. Yeah. Well, how about this one? 80% of our work day is spent on things that have little or no value. What? That's just depressing. <laughs> Employees do their best work between 9 a.m. and 12 p.m. Now, this is what experts are finding is the most productive time for most of us. These are our most productive hours. I know there are some of you that, you know, have different peak times, but for the most part, nine to 12 is our, our best time. I'm, I met a, a nurse who is an amazing person. She works night shift and she has for years and it's by choice. You know, it's not just because she's new or somebody doesn't like her. She likes night shift, like night, night shift. Like, you know, they start at seven and go to seven the next morning, 12 hour shifts. I said to her, you know, why do you, why do you request that shift? I mean, what is it about that shift that you like? And she said, you know, my internal clock is just upside down. Since I was a kid, I'm just better at night. And at nighttime, when most people are going into their sleep cycle, I'm the opposite. <laughs> my sleep cycle happens during the day. I hadn't really considered that before. Okay. So there are some people that have different times, but for the most part, 9 to 12 is our most productive time. And how about this one? 10 to 12 minutes invested in planning your day will save at least, this is mind-boggling, two hours of wasted time and effort every day. <sighs> 10 to 12 minutes invested in planning your day will save at least two hours of wasted time and effort every day. That may seem a little out there to you, it did to me, but then I started thinking, do I spend 10 to 12 minutes a day planning? I've actually kind of changed my habits a little bit because of that number. It scared me really bad. <laughs> so here today, we're going to talk about some new rules, some new ideas, and just maybe a new life, right? <laughs> so here's the first thing. We have to, I'm calling this, you know, what you need to know and what you need to forget, the new rules. All right, so here's the first thing know how to be thoughtfully proactive. Forget about being thoughtlessly reactive. Okay, let me break that down. How to be thoughtfully proactive. How to be proactive. What to do to plan your time, to develop what you need to do to be productive instead of just reacting. And I think you know the difference between reacting and not. <laughs> reacting and responding. Remember those terms? There's a formula for this. Maybe you've heard this before. E plus R equals O. E plus R equals O. Will you react or will you respond? Event plus response equals outcome. This is the formula. You see, when we respond instead of react, that means that we do it with thought. We put some thinking behind that response. We think about what's gonna happen as a result of that decision. When we, react, when we react, it's just from emotion. It's just like, here's my reaction and you know we go on. Reaction is not a good land to be in most of the time. Now there are times when we need to react. Like if you're about to get hit by a bus, you should not stop to think about which direction you should jump out of the way. You should just jump, okay? <laughs> but, there, but most of the time in our business life, we do have time to plan our responses if we take time to do it. There's been so much brain research lately. We have so much more information than we've ever had on brain research. And we've actually learned that there's a thinking brain versus a reactive brain. Now the thinking brain is the upper part of the brain and that's conscious and intentional decisions made there. That, this is when we think through it, conscious and intentional decisions. Reactive brain impulses can be consciously redirection, redirected and overridden here. And, and this is where we act rather than react. So we really wanna operate from our thinking brain. 
our reactive brain is the lower part of the brain. And this is where we get fight or flight. Feelings or emotions are processed here. Pleasure and enjoyment are processed here. Deep-seated habits live here, which is why, it, why it's so easy to react because it, those things have been with us for a very long time. They're deeply ingrained, so they're fast. So a lot of times we just go from our reactive brain, our reflexes, instead of our thinking brain. We really need to, to work on developing our ability to operate from that thinking brain instead of our reactive brain. I planned it this way. This is how I'm going to do it. I'm going to stick with my plan, even though I have these impulses telling me to oh, stop doing this and do something else. I've got to stick with my plan. Neuroscience now shows that it is possible to deliberately rewire your brain with practice to use your thinking brain more and your reactive brain less. So that's something to put on your to-do list. <laughs> operate from my thinking brain and I have to remember to do this. And a lot of this is about planning, which turns out to be one of the single most effective strategies you can use in order to reach any goal. When people engage in the right kind of planning, their success rates go up on an average between 200 to 300%. Whoa, right? So planning. Take time you need to get in the zone, maybe 30 minutes for the week and maybe 10 minutes a day just to stop and plan. You know, my habit is to stop at one point during my day and reshuffle everything. Look at what's on my desk, see why it's here. Look at my, my little calendar that I've kept, make sure I've got things on there that I need. Go to my workspace here where everything's laid out. Make sure it's organized in the way it needs to be. I spend at least 10 minutes a day just going over everything before I'll allow myself to stop working so that I'll be more prepared for the next day. Whether you do it that way or you do it first thing in the morning, take the time that you need to kind of get in that zone and figure out what has to be done. But don't over plan. You know, I think a, a perfect example of that is if you have kids, right? <laughs> for those of you who have little children and you're planning their birthday party. Our tendency as grown-ups is to really over-plan that party, you know? Well, we'll do this, and we'll have this game, and then we'll eat cake, and then we'll have ice cream, and then we'll do this game. And, you know, it, a really great kid's party has very little planned. <laughs> because that was work, that's what works for little kids, you know? They just want cake. They want to hang out with their friends, you know? Don't over-plan it. Um, planning reminds me a lot of like a recipe book because I learned this really important lesson from a recipe book. You know, I, I, I hadn't really paid much attention to how a recipe book was laid out. Like if you look at a recipe, it starts out with a list of ingredients, right? And if you start by gathering those ingredients and then you try to cook, you know, it goes a whole lot better, <laughs> a whole lot better. So think about who you're planning What's going to make this day highly successful? In the cooking example, if I have all the ingredients on that list and I look at that list first, I have a much higher chance of success than if I get into making this recipe and find out I don't have what I need to make the recipe, right? So think about what's going to make your day highly successful. What priorities do you have? Take time to block time on your calendar and add to your to-do lists or whatever system you're using, but block some time for planning actually to make sure that you, you get in the habit of doing that. Check with yourself during the day. Are you sticking to that plan? <laughs> You've made a plan, check back, make sure you, you stick to it. Try to develop some habits and rituals around that entire thing and refresh your plan often. So with cooking, you know, first you, you gather your list of things that are there. And then as you're doing, as you're going through the recipe and making this dish, you check back, right? Now, how much of this was I supposed to put in? Go back and make sure that you're going according to plan. And if you follow that plan, if you follow that recipe, usually you have a pretty good outcome. If we could relate that to what we're doing in our everyday work, maybe we'd have a much better outcome. So planning is a very important part. Now I want to talk to you a minute about prioritizing because prioritizing is so hard. How do we figure out how to prioritize? Well, I have some tips for you on this. And the first thing is this, 
What's most important right now? You know, what's the most important thing that you need to do today to survive, to not get fired, <laughs> to make the rest of your life better? You know, stop and think, what's the most important thing right now? That's where you start. That's got to be your priority. And usually if you ask somebody, hey, what's the most important thing to you right now? They can tell you it's just they haven't taken really time to think about it. So that's the first thing when you're prioritizing. What's most important right now? From there, what task will have the most important impact on your business results? What task will have the most important impact on business results? I have to consider this all the time in my business because I'll tell you the task that sucks my energy and sucks my time. Sometimes it's social media. And I have to think, you know, if I go in on social media and I play nice on there because it's kind of fun, you know, to see what everybody is doing, is that going to have an impact on the, my business results today? Is that going to have the most important impact? Or is writing these three proposals where people have actually asked me to do work for them more important? So I have to weigh those things and decide what's going to have the most impact on my business results which takes us back to what's most important right now, social media or writing the proposals, right? So it helps me to write the proposals, <laughs> get something going where I have something going, right? And if you still need more, how about this? What did you promise to do? You know, if you made promises, that should be on your priority list. If you promised somebody that you would do something for them by tomorrow, then that needs to be on your list. That's important. That's a promise that you made. You know, if you're a business person, those promises that you make, that goes to establishing trust. And establishing trust goes to more business. <laughs> so if you promise somebody something, that needs to go on your list. And, and finally, what tasks need to be done to meet deadlines? What is it that you have to do to meet certain deadlines? So this is a list of things that you can think through when you're identifying your tasks to decide which ones have to be done right now. I think it's really important to, to pay attention to your tasks and to look at what's going on to make sure that you are doing the most important ones and not allowing your time to get sucked up with things that maybe aren't even necessary at all. It's, it's very interesting. One time I worked for the state of Florida for a number of years and one time I, in my career, I was so completely overwhelmed. Like, I, I don't know, it was so stressful. You know, there was so much. And there was this one report that we had to do every month. And my poor supervisors, I had 15 supervisors. They all had to do this report. And then we had to compile it into one big departmental report. It was taking us like at least two days every month to do this report because the supervisors would spend almost a whole day doing their report. And then on my end, administratively, we had to take that report and roll it into one for the department. It was awful. It was hideous. So I, I finally one day got really brave, you know, after struggling for this for quite some time. And I asked the, uh, the head of our, our department, our, actually our district administrator, why are we submitting this report? And the answer I got was that, well, we need those in case we need those. <laughs> okay, and so what, what exactly happens to them when we send them to you? Because I mean, my office is not the only one doing this. We're doing this all across our district. You know, there's probably like 10 of those reports going up there every month. Well, we file them, they said. You file them. Yeah, we, you see that we have these cabinets over here. When you come in next time, you can see there's like a, a whole room of cabinets where we file those things every month so that we have that data. So, okay, but what do you do with them? We file them. When's the last time somebody asked you for data from that? Hmm, I don't know, but we have it. <laughs> I, I rebelled. I went for two months without doing my reports. I told everybody just to stop. And guess what happened? Nothing at all. Nobody even noticed that we weren't sending our reports. And when they did, fortunately, instead of firing me, <laughs> they decided maybe they should take a look because nobody had even noticed that we weren't sending them and uh, the world didn't end. So that, that prompted some more research on, are we doing work here that's unnecessary? And when we contacted the state office, found out that the state office had quit doing them 
almost a year before. <laughs> so if you really analyze your tasks and think about it and look at prioritizing, maybe you'll find some unnecessary work, for it, work that you're doing that absolutely doesn't do anything for you. We have to be proactive here, right? We have to be proactive in taking care of our own time management. Your to-do list. A to-do list is a really, really effective tool. I love my to-do list and it, it helps me to keep track of all the tasks that I have to do. Sometimes I think it's therapeutic because it's like a brain dump, you know, you just dump everything on this list. And it feels so good when you check something off, doesn't it? it just feels so good. It's like a major accomplishment. I did this and I check it off. But I have some bad news. Check this out. As much as 80% of your success today will come from only 20% of the items on your to-do list. What? <laughs> yeah. That means that only two of those tasks are really important on this list of 10, only two. As much as 80% of your success comes from 20% of those items, only two. That's something to really think about, that we're not just running around doing busy work, but that we're going back and going through that activity of prioritizing our tasks to see what's most important and what's gonna give us the best business results. With your to-do list, a couple of tips. Consider doing multiple lists. I actually have multiple to-do lists and, and I enjoy that because it gives me a way to park everything I'm thinking of. I think sometimes we're overwhelmed with time management just because there are so many things and when we try to keep in our head all these things we have to do, we become very overwhelmed. So I suggest using multiple to-do lists. You know, I have one for family tasks. You know, I have one for travel. And I have one for, you know, my, my everyday work. And even if, I, if I'm doing a project, you know, like I have several projects going on at once, each one of those project lists have, you know, a to-do list. And what that allows me to do in my planning time is first identify which one of those has priority and then look at what two things I can do to be really impactful today instead of being overwhelmed with 10 tasks that I can't possibly get done. So think about maybe multiple lists, maybe, maybe not trying to put everything on one list. Take time every day to prioritize your list. And we've just talked about how to prioritize and make sure that your action items are specific with no dependencies. Now, this is tricky. <laughs> and this is where a lot of people go wrong with, with uh, their to-do list. They don't understand this thing about dependencies. So let me explain to you what I mean about dependencies. Dependencies are things that need to be done in order to complete whatever you've written on your to-do list. Sometimes we go too big picture with our to-do list. Um, let me try to give you an example. Um, one of the things that I need to complete is I need to complete this proposal. All right, I need to complete this proposal for a new client. So I put on my to-do list, complete proposal for a new client. But if I go back and ask myself, wait, what do you need to complete that proposal? What do I need to do this? What do I need to complete this proposal? Okay, well, I can't just write the proposal because the first thing is, is I don't really understand the scope of the project. I don't understand. They've asked me to do some training and I don't understand how much training. Are they talking about a week's training or are they talking about, you know, three hours? I don't really understand that. So my to-do list, instead of saying do the proposal, should say find out the scope of the project for this new client so that I can begin working on the proposal. That's what my list should say, because that's very different than do the, do the proposal. I can't possibly do the proposal until I know the scope of the project. And then there's going to be a few thing, other things I need to do. Will I need materials? So instead of writing another task tomorrow to do this project, now that I know the scope of it, now my, my new item for that list is to define the materials needed for this project so that I can add that into the cost of the proposal. You see what I'm saying? So those are all dependencies. You know, you don't just write, get my car fixed. <laughs> First, you have to figure out who's going to fix it. Well, what specialist shop are you going to go to? Then you have to, the next thing is you have to make an appointment to get your car fixed, right? Before you actually take your car to get it fixed. 
So the problem with our to-do list sometimes is that we write the same things over and over and over on our to-do list because we're going macro and we need to go more micro. We need to define all the dependencies that have to happen in order to do that task. So that's what that means about making sure that your items are specific. And remember that your to-do list alone is not a time management system. It's a tool, but by itself, it's not a time management system. I wanna show you this because this is considered a, a highly effective and responsive way to deal with tasks. And um, this comes actually from Dwight Eisenhower and that's why it's called the Eisenhower Decision Matrix. I'm showing this to you because in the research that I've done, people who use this system say that it is highly effective and it has eliminated a lot of their time management issues. Dwight Eisenhower was known to have said, what is important is seldom urgent and what is urgent is seldom important. <laughs> That's from Dwight Eisenhower. What is important is seldom urgent. And what is urgent is seldom important. Uh, to me, that kind of talks about the reactive versus responsive brain, you know, the reactive versus thinking brain. Hmm. But here's how this works. You take those tasks that are on your to-do list and you classify them according to this criteria right here. So as you can see on the left axis, you have non-important and important, and on the top, urgent and not urgent. So you take the task. Okay, I have to do this proposal for this new project. It is important, so I'm moving up there to important. <laughs> is it urgent or not urgent? If it's urgent, like if I don't get this to them now, I'm going to lose it totally, then it goes on my do it now list. But if it's like, well, you know, they said just get this to them within the next two weeks, then I'm gonna to go to my decide list over here and schedule a time to do it. So I'm gonna to go to my calendar and write down on Friday afternoon to do the proposal for this new project. You see how that works? So that's what you do with each one of your tasks. If you decide this is not important, but it's urgent, see who else can do it. Maybe someone can do this for you. So delegate it. Um, if it's not important and it's not urgent, don't do it at all, <laughs> get rid of it. So like I said, um, you might want to Google this because this is known to be a really uh, successful model that people use to help them prioritize their tasks. So you could take your to-do list and just plug it in on here and, and have this little matrix to help you to know what you should do right now versus what you should schedule to do or maybe give to someone else to do or maybe not even do that darn report at all, right? <laughs> exactly. Okay. So there we go. These are some ways for you to be reactive, thoughtfully reactive, instead of thoughtlessly reactive. Be proactive. All right. Here's number two. Know how to focus and forget about trying to multitask. Yeah, I know that's painful. <laughs> know how to focus and forget about trying to multitask. I'm convinced that one of the problems that we have with time management today is that there's just so much stuff going on around us that it's very hard for us to just focus on one thing. So we have to be very conscientious about this and, and learn how to focus. So first, let's talk about, you know, your favorite thing, multitasking. I have to tell you the truth about multitasking. It's not really possible to multitask. I know you don't want to hear it, <laughs> but it's not. Humans cannot do lots of things simultaneously. Instead, what we do is switch our attention from task to task very quickly. This actually started in the 1960s when it was used to describe computers. Back then, 10 megahertz was so mind-boggling fast that they needed a new word to describe the computer's ability to quickly perform many tasks. Multitasking is about multiple tasks, alternately sharing one resource, which is the CPU, the central processing unit, which guess what, is your brain. <laughs> but in time, the term became interpreted to mean multiple tasks being done simultaneously. But the truth is that's, that's misleading 
because not even computers can process more than one piece of code at a time. And our human brain definitely cannot. This explains how it's possible for you to drive and listen to an audio book at the same time, right? You can do that. You can drive and listen to an audio book. And then when you get to work, you'll go, how did I get here? I wonder where I turned. <laughs> You're on autopilot. You don't even remember how you got to work. See, the truth is you can only focus up one of the, on one of those tasks at a time. When you have to stop at a stop sign, you focus on stopping and your mind goes off of the book for just a split second. Because what's happening is your mind is switching from thing to thing very quickly, but one or the other, you're not doing both at the same time. That's why we can't text and drive. <laughs> And even listening to an audiobook, sometimes I have to shut mine off because there's too many things going on around me and I can't really focus on my driving and I need to. We can only focus on one thing at a time. And there's a proven physical effect to this, the release of stress hormones and adrenaline. And that's not good. <laughs> oh, and finally, multiple research studies show that multitasking actually reduces Productivity and quality actually reduces. I was doing some, some research on this. An American study reported in the Journal of Experimental Psychology found that it took students far longer to solve complicated math problems when they had to switch to other tasks. In fact, they were up to 40% slower. An HBR study reveals that multitaskers take 50% longer to accomplish a task and make up to 50% more errors. Oh my. Again, you don't believe me? Google it. <laughs> Google it and you'll find that multitasking is, is really not something that, that is possible. It's kind of a misnomer. Okay, so you still think you can do it? You think you, you can multitask? I'm going to show you how, how it feels. All right. So we're going to try this. This is really brave and daring, but I think we can do it. I've got my phone here, which has a, a, a stopwatch on it for me. And, he, and here's the experiment we're going to try. We're going to try this. So I need you to get a, a blank piece of paper, get a blank piece of paper and a pen, something you can write on, just a piece of scrap paper, whatever. You got it? Okay. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to time you. And what I want you to do is I want you to write, I can multitask, just like it says on the screen there, I can multitask, exclamation point. And then when you're done writing, I can multitask, exclamation point, I want you to write the numbers one through 10. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10, right under it. So you'll have two lines on your paper that you're filling out. The first line you're writing, I can multitask, exclamation point. On the second line, you're writing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, in numerical form. Okay, so I'm going to time you. I'm going to give you like 15 seconds to see how far you can get with that. So that's the first step. You ready? All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna be quiet now for like 15 seconds while I give you a chance to do that. Ready? Go. Okay, and stop. Did you get it done? That wasn't too hard, right? You probably got done. I think you probably were able to write, I can multitask and write the numbers like that. And, and I, I did like 15 seconds, okay? Not too bad. All right, we're gonna do it again. Only this time we're gonna do it a little bit differently. All right, so here's how I want you to do it this time. Still two lines and you're gonna write the same thing. I can multitask, exclamation point, and the numbers one through 10. But this time, I want you to write one and then the other. So on, on the first line, you write I, and then down below, you write one. Then you write C, then you write two, then you write A, then you write three. So you're going to alternate back and forth between the letters and the numbers. Okay? You see what I'm saying? So I, and then go down and put one. C, and then go down and put two. And keep going back and forth until you write both I can multitask and the numbers one through 10, like you did before. You ready? All right, here we go. Go.
and stop. Okay, how'd it go? <laughs> Did you get done a second time? I don't know about you, but when I do this, I can actually feel my brain shift. I mean, I can feel my head going one, no, wait, I, no, wait, I, one, C, I can feel my brain. Could you feel it? Could you like feel your brain shifting focus in between those two tasks? Isn't that nuts? And that's what happens when you're trying to multitask. <sighs> that was so fun. I hope you had fun too. That exercise amazes me. The one thing, that's what we want to focus on. What's the one thing that you can do such that by doing it, everything else will be easier or unnecessary? This is from a book called The One Thing by Gary Keller. Give him credit here. But that's the question he asked. And that's a hard question. <laughs> I ask myself that. I try to ask myself that almost every day. What's the one thing you can do that by doing it, everything else will be easier or unnecessary? And, and sometimes I really have to think about that. But, you know, the proposal example, for, for example, you know, that's a hard thing. And it takes me it takes me some time to write a good proposal, to consider everything, because it, it essentially becomes the contract, you know, for everything that I'm going to do and the services I'm going to provide. But once that piece is done, from there, everything is easy. Because I've laid everything out, I've taken time to plan through it, I've taken time to identify all the parameters and the service I'll provide. So from there, it becomes easy. And I think that's what we're talking about here. But there's a question to ask yourself. What's the one thing that I can do such that by doing it, everything else will be necessary, will be easy, or even unnecessary? Interesting question. Remember, your most important priority is the one thing that you can do right now that will help you achieve what matters most. If you're a boss, Remember that you have to help your employees to understand what is the most important priority. So many times when I work in an organization, I'll ask their employees one by one, what's your main thing? What's the most important thing for y'all right now? We all working on, what's the main thing? You won't believe it. I get different answers from every employee. Sometimes there are some similarities, but many times they're completely different. You know what that means? That means that the employees are working really, really hard on different things and sometimes the wrong thing. So it's important for us as bosses to identify what is the main thing? What, is, what, what are the priorities? And help our employees to understand how to identify those priorities for themselves. Now, here's another thing with focus, protecting your time. It's up to you to know how to protect your time. And this isn't always easy because, you know, we're nice people and, you know, we, we try to accommodate others. But the first thing is, is you have to uh, adopt this mindset that whatever you set up, this can't be moved. You know, this is, I've set this time to meet with my employee and I'm going to do it. We see this a lot like with one-on-ones. People decide, well, this isn't important is at, this isn't as important as maybe meeting with that customer. So I'll move the employee and put the customer in. No, no. <laughs> You've got to get that mindset that this is time that I have set for this. And that's what I'm going to do. I've set aside time for a, an hour uninterrupted. I'm going to do that. I'm not going to let anything intrude on that. So part of this is mindset. You've got to have the mindset that when you schedule these tasks for yourself, when you schedule this time for yourself, that that's what you do with that time frame. You'll find time to do that other thing. But let's make sure that you have that mindset. That you have to protect your own time. If you have higher level requests, you know, your boss says, but no, I really need to see you from 12 to one. Okay, you're gonna say yes, because this is, you know, the boss, this is a higher level request. But then you can negotiate. You can say, okay, I know that you need to see me. Can we do it from two to three? <laughs> a lot of times they'll say yes, you know, okay, two to three is fine, you know, so, so say yes. I mean, don't get yourself in trouble, but then see if you can negotiate a little bit. 
when your mind wanders off to other stuff when you're trying to focus, right? And that happens, you know, I'm trying to do this and my mind's wandering off to other things. You have to just stop and give your brain a second to park that item. I keep a pad here all the time. And what I do is when that happens, I write it down, write down, I write down. And it's like just the act of writing it down and moving on allows me to come back and focus on what I needed to be focusing on. It didn't go away. I've got it list, listed right here. I know I need to do that and I'll come back to that. But right now I've got to focus on this. So if your mind starts to wonder, just park it somewhere and, and stay focused on what you're working on. Sometimes you have to ask for support. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, tell people, you know what? I blocked this time off on my calendar from four to 4.30 to do some personal planning. And I need your, your help in protecting me from being interrupted during that time. That's what your network is for. So ask for some, for some support. You know, I have a report that's due on Friday. It's going to take me three hours and I can do it in three hours if I can just, you know, not answer the phone and just, just be alone for three hours. Can you help me do that? And you'd be surprised because you can do the same thing for them as well. So ask for support. Learn how to say no. There's a good way to say no. I call it can-do language. You know, you don't say, no, I can't give you that proposal by tomorrow. You say, I can give you that proposal in two days. <laughs> so talk to people about what you can do instead of just what you can't do. Sometimes you have to say no. You know, sometimes you have to say, this is not something that I, I, I need to be doing. Learn to say no when you have to. You can't say yes to everything. Learn to say no. If you can negotiate something else, if you can work that angle, great. But don't be doing things that you just know have absolutely no purpose for you and that are just going to suck up your time. Learn how to say no. And finally, just manage your interruptions. You know, if you allow interruptions, it creates a culture that interruptions are okay. You know what I'm saying? It's like the more we allow it, the more people believe it's okay to interrupt. If that's your culture and that's what you want, that's cool. But I kind of doubt it. But look at this. Typical time between interruptions in a workplace, 11 minutes. You have 11 minutes before someone's going to interrupt you. <laughs> the average time it takes to get back to where you were once you've had that interruption is 25 minutes. Now, you know this is true. You know that when you're in the middle of something and you're focused and somebody comes in and interrupts you, it takes forever to get back into it. Where was I? What was I thinking? What was my train of thought? Where was that paper I was working with, right? But here's the scariest statistic of all. The average abandonment rate, 25%. 25% of the time, we don't get back to it at all until maybe days later, if ever. So interruptions are, are not good. Just be careful not to encourage interruptions because if you do allow them, like I said, it reinforces that it's okay. Educate your internal customers and your external customers. Say they know the best way to contact you and when. One of the things that I saw coming out of COVID that I thought was one of the best time management techniques I've seen, and it was just a result of COVID, was people who were working remotely I saw several people in the SBDC actually start including in their signature line their work hours. It will say working remotely from nine to three with a phone number. So that helped me so much as a customer, I knew when to call them and how to call them if that's, that was their work hours. But it also sets times for them. That says to their external customers and even to their employees or whoever that these are my work hours, nine to three. And then I'm sure they have some other arrangement for the other hours. But external customers, I'm not going to call after three because those are the core hours that I've been given in, in that signature line. So I thought that was really, really brilliant. It was well defined for me. And have regular meetings with those that are most likely. Now, this was a little controversial because, you know, I'm asking you to meet more frequently instead of less with people who interrupt you more in order to get them to interrupt you less. 
<laughs> what does that mean? Okay, so do you do you know some of those people who they need to come to you for everything? I mean, they come to you to ask you questions all the time. They just have, seem to have no sense of what it means to to interrupt people. It's it's just natural for them. They come to you all the time. One way to handle that is to ask them to come back and see you in the morning at 8.15 or whatever time you decide. So every morning, actually, at 8.15, I want you to come see me. And I want you to save all those questions that you have for me for that 8.15 slot. Because from 8.15 to 8.30, it's just you and me. Whatever you need, fire away. Okay? All right, that sounds extreme. But here's the thing. So for 15 minutes a day, you focus on that one employee. And when they come back at nine o'clock, you can say, hey, save this for tomorrow at 8.15. And we'll talk about it then. What you're teaching them is how to prioritize their questions, how to have their questions ready, how to be a steward of your time and their own. And actually their productivity will increase as well as your own. So have regular meetings with those that are most likely. Okay, so I'm just giving you a ton of tips for how to focus, how to focus. Allow, don't allow interruptions, you know, know how to manage that, you know how to prioritize now, you know how to protect your time, take care of yourself, focus. Focus on being productive. Hmm. And that's our last one that we wanted to talk about is how to be personally productive. Forget about what other people are doing. Let's talk about how you can be personally productive. And the first thing is, is you need a workflow management system. Now, workflow management systems are not taught in school, you know, so a lot of times we're left to our own devices to come up with something. So if you're someone who uses like sticky notes all over the place or uses those little flags in your email or all kinds of um, papers laying around your desk with different things to do, you may have been a victim of that. And it's really leaving, like if you're the boss, you know, you're really leaving your company's productivity to chance when we don't have some kind of a workflow management system. So let's talk about how to do that for yourself and how to help others to do that. First thing is, is you've got to create your own system. All these other things are great, like Daytimer and all these cool things, you know, that I've talked about. They're awesome. And, and if they work for you, that's amazing. But even those systems have to be made into a system that works for you personally. You have to make it your own. So create your own system, something that works for you. That takes some time to figure out. But I hope I'm giving you a lot of tips that will help you to be able to figure that out. Make it something you can see, not just something that you think about. It has to be on paper. I mean, it has to be a system that you can see, you know, it, your calendar and, and your to-do list and all the stuff that you have, you know, these have to be actual things that you can see, not just in my head, I know I need to do this. <laughs> so something that you can see outside of your own head. Incorporate all these lessons that you've learned today, such as time for planning, like, you know, that should be part, part of your workflow management system is where are you going to do your planning and are you going to do that every day? I hope you will. And as you're looking at those to-do items, will you use the Eisenhower matrix to classify and, how, and figure out how to prioritize and what to do with those tasks? What are you going to do? What's going to be your system? What's going to work for you? Keep it simple, keep it uncluttered, and keep it intentional. And keeping it simple is... The problem sometimes with some of these other elaborate systems that you can buy and pay big money for, although they're tons of fun <laughs> and they can work for a lot of people, they're not sustainable because they they uh, they become a little bit cluttered. But what whatever works for you, if that works for you, awesome. You know, this has to be something that is for you, designed for you, and is it's personal. Your workflow management system has to be personal because this is about you being personally productive and timing is really important daniel pink wrote this whole book when the scientific secrets of perfect timing and he said that when people work often matters as much as what they do what? yeah when people work often matters as much as what they do so when are you most productive 
Are you in the majority of people who are most productive between nine and 12? Maybe yes, maybe no. If you're like my nurse friend, no, that's not when she's most productive. That's when she's sleepy. <laughs> you know, she's most productive from midnight to 3 a.m. Fine, whatever works for you. This is your personal system, but try to figure out when you are most productive. Usually the day for most people begins with kind of a peak. And then we go through a little period, a little dip, you know, where we're not as energized. And then, and usually most of us then have another little kick in the afternoon or whenever that, that kind of brings us back up and, and helps us to finish with a little bit of recovery. But the lesson here is, is to pick out, you know, to figure out what's mostly your best time, your most productive time, and make sure that you schedule those really hard tasks during that time when you know that you are, are most productive. Some of the numbers that, some of the statistics and information that Daniel Pink shared on this are really amazing. Just a few things. Like he said that for as, as a rule, when people do like calls in the afternoon, as a general rule, calls are more negative and irritable if they're made in the afternoon, <laughs> just because that's for most people the time when they're going through that, that dip in their energy. Easier chores like updating social media and email should be saved for that afternoon dip, he said. Hmm, interesting. So think about it. You know, when are you most productive? When is your energy level the highest? When is it the lowest? When's the best time for maybe you to um, do email versus making phone calls? When you work matters as much as what you do. What's the best time for meetings? What energizes you? What's the best place for you to get work done? Again, this is all about being personally productive. The key is to continually experiment and try different techniques and find out what works for you. Some things may or may not work in a particular context or situation. So try, try some different approaches, but really try them. You know, don't just decide you're going to change the way that you read your email for a week and then give up because it didn't work. <laughs> if you want something kind of entertaining to read that's so far out there that it's crazy and helpful, um, The Four-Hour Work Week by Tim Ferriss. Some of the concepts he has in there about time management are so mind-blowing that when I bring them back to reality, they're helpful, you know? Like he said, he doesn't even read his email during the day at all. He doesn't like at all until four o'clock. And he has an autoresponder for his email until that time that says, I don't read email until four o'clock. If you need me before that, here's my phone number, call me. <laughs> so nobody sends him an email and paces the floor saying, why hasn't he answered my email? Because they got an autoresponder that says, I'm not even gonna look at this until four o'clock. Wow. Hey, whatever works for you to keep you personally productive and doesn't get you fired, of course. <laughs> Is, is something you need to, to explore, but give it a shot. You know, don't just give up on it right away. Try some different things and find out what really, what really works for you. Some ideas for being personally productive. Retrain your mind to focus on one thing. This is a great technique. If you have something you really have to get done and you just can't get into it, just set your timer for 10 minutes and promise yourself that you'll work for 10 minutes. What usually happens is 10 minutes later, you're into it, you're focused on it, and you can keep going forward on it. But if you really are wasting your time after 10 minutes, then stop, park it for a while and come back. So that's, that's an idea. Retrain your mind to focus on just one thing. When you're stressed, you're frazzled, take a break. And here's the, the key here. Do something that will calm you, not upset you. <laughs> the worst mistake I make is when I'm like, oh, I need a break from this project. Let me go look at my email. Oh my gosh, I end up more upset than anything because now there's 10 more tasks I need to do. And I didn't even know it until I read that stupid email, you know? <laughs> so if I need to take a break, I don't go read email. I go get a cup of coffee or do, do something, step outside for a minute, take some deep breaths, do a quick yoga pose, whatever works for me to calm me, not upset me, right? Set a time of the day when you turn off your email and your other notifications and just allow yourself to work without interruption. And, you know, 
there's a lot of devices to turn off. Make sure you get them all. <laughs> I usually miss something like my, my, uh, my watch or something, but turn off those notifications and just, just be, just let yourself work. Set boundaries for yourself. Um, headphones, do not disturb, work from home. And here's something you could try. Conduct an attention audit. What is that? It's when you look around and say, what really is in the way for me? What's keeping me from being productive? You know, why is it that I'm losing focus? Uh, interesting story. Uh, a friend of mine was really excited about this new job, but she was, after two months, really disappointed because she said she just couldn't focus at work. I'm like, well, what's going on? You can't focus. I don't know. You know, I said, okay, try an attention on it. Just just stop when you lose focus and say, what just happened? What's going on? What's causing this? What's in my environment that's making me not focus? Turns out her office was like next door to the kitchen. And whenever somebody was going into the kitchen, you know, they would use the microwave and that ding would go, make her think she knew she was getting a message. And she was, you know, <laughs> she completely unfocused on what she was doing and was like looking for the source of that ding but it was subconscious she didn't even realize that was going on all the time so do a little audit to find out what's what's going on around you and then see what you can do about it to maybe help you to be more focused remember that the most valuable resource is you you're what's most important so you know take deep breaths eat and sleep and relax and connect and take breaks and go outside when you can Eat healthy, hydrate. Taking care of yourself is the most, the most important thing because it's, it's the greatest resource that you, that you have. Most valuable resource, you. Take care of you. All right, one last thing here, and here's your bonus. Forget about time management. <laughs> Forget it. It, it. It's not exactly obsolete, but I don't think it's something we need to focus on. I think what we need to focus on is attention management not time management, attention management. Here's the difference. Remember the definition of time management? The ability to plan and control how you spend the hours in your day to effectively accomplish your goals. And I kind of laughed when I gave you this definition and said, yeah, if only I could control it, right? But look at the definition of attention management. The ability to keep focused on important and relevant tasks while avoiding distractions in order to maximize productivity. See, it might be that time management is impossible, but attention management is totally within your control. Totally. The ability to keep focused, you know how to do it. We just talked about it. On important and relevant tasks, we've figured out now how to prioritize. While avoiding distractions, we talked about how to to stop interruptions and how to watch for distractions in order to maximize your productivity using your own personal productivity workflow system. All right. So the new rules of time management, let's make a list. Now, what do we know? Well, we know that focus is key, one objective at a time. We know how to prioritize. We've got some questions and tools to help us with that. We know that multitasking is not for real, that we can't actually do that. We know that productivity peaks are for real, that we do have times when we're more productive. Let's see, we know that um, rest breaks do increase productivity, even five minutes. Sometimes I have to force myself to take, take a little break because I'm into it, you know? But I do know that when I take a minute, just to take a break, I do come back sharper. Priority tasks have to be defined every day. <laughs> the UPS truck. Do you know about my dog, right? Okay. And momentum is very important. That 10 minutes, setting that timer for 10 minutes so that you can be focused is a great, great idea. All right. So here's what I want you to do. This is your homework. I want you to make yourself a list of what you need to do and what you need to forget so that you can be personally productive, that you can focus on what's important and you can be responsive instead of reactive. 
There's some other good reads on time management for you. And here's a list of things. These are all, all great and things that I use in my research. So you might want to pull some of these things out, Google some information and learn, learn all that you can so that you can master time management. Thanks, everybody. Great being with you again. I'm going to go see what the UPS man has to deliver now. Take care.